So we have to start with uh, our first keynote speaker uh, uh, of this conference, uh, and this is a special guest, uh, David Goldsmith, uh, co-founder and president of Goldsmith Organization, focusing on uh, consulting, uh, forecasting, and advising to many top-ranked companies, but not only top-ranked companies, but also technology startups, educational, and research organizations. And uh, more than this, uh, uh, he's uh, very famous uh, as uh, many award winners and also as uh, the author, not the only one author, but one of authors of this uh, uh, nice book with uh, very engaging title, so Paid to Think. And I, I really think that today we have a uh, keynote talk not, about, not only about how to become a leader in today's world and how to hold leadership, but also how to think in the better way in this uh, world of technology and engineering. So, uh, dear David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Every day you wake up and you start asking yourself questions about tomorrow. And you're asking yourself what decisions you should be making to improve your organization. One of the challenges that you have are what are those decisions or questions you should be asking, what are the decisions you should be making? In the short time today, we're going to cover or look at how you can improve that decision making from all different types of perspectives. One that I can say is before I came here, I ended up interviewing, I don't know, uh, 10 people who are prospective members of this audience to get a feel for some of the challenges you're facing. The irony is the challenges you're facing are no different than anybody else in the world. And I've worked with people such as uh, uh, Infos uh, the, uh, Jean Premzi of Wipro, uh, Nandan Ilakani of Infosys, and some of the big technology companies. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Russia, you're in India, you're in Hong Kong, you're in Silicon Valley. The challenges are very much the same. So let's start with a, a very simple concept. And I'm going to give you both combination of concepts and tools. There th and if the pen works. There are three different types of people in this room here today in broad thinking, three types. The first type is a person who is retro. Retro means past. And a retro person spends a lot of time in the past, some in the current, and some of their time in the future. There are current-oriented people. And a current-oriented person does the same type thing, past, current, and future, but a little bit more balanced. So they're looking a little bit further ahead. The last type of person is a future-oriented person. And that person spends some time in the past, current, and a lot of time in the future. Now, what I'd like you to do very quickly is decide where in the continuum across this, where do you think you stand if you had to put a mark on the chart? Before I do that, a very short story. I was in Cartagena, Colombia, speaking to, uh, just before I was speaking to 1,000 people. And I heard some people behind me talking. And uh, it's all in Spanish, so I'm trying to grab it. I do speak Spanish. And I understood them to say that they ran, each of them had 200 employees they worked with. And every speaker who got up said, let's think about the future. Let's, you got to think about the future. But they didn't give many tools. And I hear one guy say, I can't think about the future. I've got enough going on. Well, I turn around, start having a discussion, and they each run with these 200 people, their own uh, uh, retail operations. And one of them had said they had a baby recently. So I said, when, just kind of moving in the direction, I said, when you had your baby, when you first got pregnant, did you think about if you'd have a boy or a girl? And he said, of course you do, everybody does. I said, did you think about where they would potentially go to school? And he said, we actually moved to be in a better place for our child. I said, then, when, did you ever think about them becoming terrible twos, horrible kids as growing up, or, or becoming teenagers and what they'd be like? He says, of course we did. How about going to university? Or maybe even one day getting married? He says, yes, I hope they get married, my children do get married. And finally, I said, did you even consider being abuelos, grandparents? And he says, every parent thinks about this. I said, so you have the potential to think 50 years in the future for your child, but you can't think more than a month in the future for your business. And they stopped and they looked and they said, you're right. If the future is not about predicting everything accurately, it's being in tune with what might change. The majority of people that I speak with say originally they're here or potentially here. The reality is most people spend most of their lives here. 
a dinner party, a meeting, uh, an update, those are all yesterday. The majority of people spend their time yesterday, not in tomorrow. The challenge with tomorrow is you have to always be on top of it. You always have to be learning, pro projecting, forecasting. So one way to look at it is this. If you were to look into the future, long term, and you were to say, uh, let's say you were driving a car, and you turn on your high beams at night to see what, what, what's actually happening. Most people say, I turn them on to see further. The reason you turn on high beams at night is not to see further. It's to anticipate. That's the sole reason. And you're going, yes. But it's not to see further. It's to anticipate so you don't have to jam on the brakes. Well, in all the interviews I had, everybody talked about hiring challenges. Everybody talked about the geopolitical challenges. Everybody talked about finding new management to fill the growth that they're having. Every single person that I spoke to in this audience or the group of people that I spoke with. The challenge is you have to change your mindset. You have to be saying to yourself, how am I going to be? And for those who can't read my writing, that's very simply what it is. Past, current, and future. You have to move over here. Spending time talking about tomorrow. So let me give you a quick example of what that might look like. If we were to look at the future of the aging pop the population in the globe, on the globe, you'll see uh, this is the population of people over 60 years old today in the world. By the year 2050, it will look like that. Can this, let me move it up a little bit for some of you who can't see. It'll look like that. It means that all of these areas that you're seeing here are going to have a large portion of the population being elderly. So to, to solve the challenges that we have, whether it be IoT, Internet of Things, we have to start understanding the dynamics of tomorrow. It means opportunities for selling. It means opportunities for building. But it also means challenges, for example, for hiring. So how do you automate? How do you improve your structure? Most people have never thought about this. Reality is... Uh, Russia is going to lose 30 million people by the year 2050. Uh, China will have 330 million people who are elderly with only a billion people. It's going to weigh them down. They're going to have huge challenges. Uh, U.S. is going to have an influx from Mexico. That'll kind of balance it out. But the world is changing into a very old population. If you start looking into the future, you'll see answers for how to build today. That's a, the first quick one that I want to give you. The second, and this is a very simple concept when you're building and growing and thinking about decision making, is that we, as humans, we tend to say to people, uh, I support you. I would, I'll support you. The challenge is in the world today, we should be spending more time saying something different, which is there's a difference between help and support. So in organizations, let's say somebody is, is buried. They have to hire 50 new employees to meet a new project that's going through. 50, and you say, wow, that's tough. But you don't realize one person is now being buried. And the organization says, I support you. We'll support you. Good leaders know that the best decision is to say, I'll help you. I'll get dirty with you. I'll help you hire. For example, maybe Nick's a great hiring person. And maybe, no, and he's not. I know he brought me. Sasha's maybe not a very good hiring person. But he needs to have 50 new people. He's good at running his operation but he's not good at hiring. What would be wrong with Nick saying, I'm not that busy, let me help you hire. But how often does that happen? How often do your teammates come to your rescue to help you? Not that often, do they? They say, we support you. So change the concept of how you're looking at building your organizations. Because the elderly population, the changing in population is just one of those trends that we're seeing. Let me give you another short tool that you can think about. You've all heard of Pareto's principle, I'm assuming. But for those of you who don't know what it means, it came about where Pareto came up with a concept that 80% of the wealth in a community was owned by 20% of the people. That's all where it came from. That's the basis. A guy by the name of Koch wrote a book called The 80-20 Principle. You might have heard it when someone says 80%, 20% of our customers give us 80% of our business. Uh, well, the reality or the change that I'd like to throw out is 80% of the results in your organization are not based on your people. They're based on the systems and structure you put in place. 
And people hate this concept that people are not the most important part of an organization. And yet you're IT. You know the value of leveraging. So think of it in this way. Let's say for the next month, you did not have a computer to work off of. You cannot access a screen, you cannot pull up a screen, cannot pull up a cell phone. You do not have a single tool that has a screen on it. How productive will you be? Will you be productive? No. Why? I thought you were talented. Are you talented? Yes? Then why aren't you talented without the screen? It's because systems and structure actually drive organizations, not people. So let me give you a very quick example. This facility here, the people have done a great job setting it up, it's all organized, but tomorrow we show up for the second half and there is no building. There is no building here. How productive will we have as a conference? Are you telling me just the building makes that much of a difference? What we tend to focus on first is the people and we hug and kiss them. You're gonna do a good job, you're really talented, we need you. Doesn't help. You give a poor program software application to a programmer, they will never deliver well. You give a hair stylist poor scissors that are dull, they will never deliver at the highest caliber. So one benefit if you start to shift to looking at systems and structure first is that you'll start to see a different type of reaction. If I say, well, you're not doing your job, you need to work harder, that's one question. But if I said, let's look at your systems and structure first, you might come back to me or you might and say, I'm having challenges with this application. I'm having challenges getting something to work. It could be a modular system. So what I, with the 80-20 principle, I'm gonna go right to the graphic to make it easier for you, is that 80% of the results of the organization come from the systems and structure and 20% by the people. This group here, the decision makers, I'm assuming most of you are, build the systems and structure that leverage the people. That's your job. If you're a decision maker, is to make sure that the systems and structure, so if you have a good programmer, or a good assistant, or a good marketing department, whatever it may be, if you design this well, you leverage these people. And what happens is it pulls blame away. And you'll often find it's not the person. It's the systems and structure that are failing. And you can relate that to IT. I've bought many applications. I've owned 15, 16 businesses. I've got a Silicon Valley company also. Every time I take away the people first and say, what would be the system and structure? And everybody participates. Then if someone doesn't deliver in the systems and structure work, You've solved half the challenges. You know where it is, it is the person. But you can, you ever give somebody a raise and expect them to do higher performing work? They come to you, say I'm going to, I'm going to jump to another company, and you say we can match it? Has their performance ever improved? No, not a single time, why not? Why hasn't it improved? Simple, you didn't change anything around them. It's the same systems and structure. So you can educate them, it's one approach. Change systems and structure, it's leveraging. It's like taking a six cylinder engine, converting it to an eight cylinder engine, if the conversion was possible, or a 12 cylinder engine. Systems and structure are what IT is about, what it, this industry is about, and you can leverage it. Next one is there's a difference between creating plans and creating ideas. When I was on the phone, I heard many of the perspectives here talking about the things they want to do, the initiatives they have in, in house. And on a few of them, I asked the simple question. Let me hear the plans. So what do you mean the plans? Well, this is the idea, and let me give you a simple concept. We want to have a great place to work. What are the plans? That's just an idea. So I was just recently working with the CEO of a company, 4,000 employees, 100, um, about a little shy of a billion in sales. And he always comes up with these ideas, great place to work, right person, right job. So we're doing this large two-year project, and he says, I want to roll all of these ideas into this project. And I said, great. He said, we need about three, four days to review everything. I said, great. So as we go through the plans, we get to a point, and I say to him, now's the time. 
great place to work. Share with me the plans on how you plan on doing that. How are you going to hire, fire, retain, train, motivate, work with? He said, well, it's really an idea we'd like to have. I said, doesn't do me any good. I, we can't just take an idea. I said, okay, let me give you the benefit of the doubt. You are the CEO of the company. Right place, right job. That means you have in place right now new tools for firing people who aren't doing their job, elevating the people who you need to do, getting rid of the employees, training the management different, different policies for people of performance, KPIs, key performance indicators. And he said, no, see, what I want people to do is put the right person in the right job. His three-day three review was less than 15 minutes all eight projects he was working on. Be careful when you're leading that you don't just have a concept or an idea, but you actually sit down and create plans. Let me give you an example. Let me uh, show you how this would work. Right now, <clears throat> we use two words all the time, strategy and tactics. Can anybody tell me what strategy is, very quickly? Anybody here? You have very few of your of pieces on, so I know you understand my English. Future. 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 Somebody else, what's strategy? Long-term plan. Long-term plan. Long -term plan. Plan, to plan to accomplish vision. Somebody else? Somebody? The idea is how to achieve it. How to achieve it. The majority of my work is outside of the US. I live in Hong Kong. Uh, I travel about 300,000 miles a year. So when an audience doesn't speak and I know they can understand, I know you're there. Uh, this is a, you, you can understand me clearly. What are tactics? Go to the tomorrow. Go to tomorrow? What to do tomorrow? Today. To do today and tomorrow. Today and tomorrow. Maybe what? How to, do How to do strategy. Somebody else over here? Actions and current situation. OK. And you heard me say it out loud, so my spelling and my writing doesn't make a difference. That's basic strategizing, basic planning. That's what people, we've been using for thousands of years. Yet in this room, you probably could not have a consensus to what planning strategy and tactics are. So how often are you in a meeting and say, what's the strategy? Or Let's use, what are the tactics? And it's almost as if I'm speaking Spanish to all of you. It's two different languages. So one day, I was frustrated with one of our companies and uh, the things we were doing. And I said, we need some advanced thinking, something a little bit more complex to handle the way we work today. The first thing I said is, we all start off with a desired outcome. We don't start off with strategy. But every meeting says, what's our strategy? What is the desired outcome is more important than the strategy. I also realized people don't know what vision, mission, goals are. Do you know how to write a mission statement? And what's the difference between a mission statement and a vision statement? And which words do you put in both? Most people have no clue. And if you were putting on a wedding, would you sit down and write your vision, mission, and goals? If you put on a party, last night we went to Banya, did you have a plan? What are our vision, mission, and goals? I achieved what I wanted. You achieved what you wanted. You had a desired outcome. That's all you had. You didn't have vision, mission, and goals. Yet we always start with strategy instead of saying, what's the desired outcome here? And there are actually three levels. I won't go into them. There's personal, there's group, and there's organizational. The organization might want one thing, the group might want another, and you personally might want another. And it's OK that you have different sets of directives. But you have to ask those questions of yourself. Now, here is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but not terribly complicated. Then there's strategy, something called a macro tactic, which is a new word, a big tactic, but no details, and then the tactics. 
Strategy is where you want to go big picture, the action you're going to take. So I'll give you an analogy using football. The American football team this past, uh, about a year and a half ago, hired a new coach. I think it was German. And he came to the United States and he said, why do you play football like everybody else? Like Europeans, like Russians, like Australians. Why don't you play like Americans? So what do you mean what, like Americans? Americans are aggressive all the time. Okay. So what he did is he took the pitch and instead of playing traditional football where everybody, the, the team, the forwards move up and then the backfield sits here, he says, we're going to press forward more. We're going to play like Americans, bring it to the opponent. That's a strategy. There's no detail. We can't follow it. A macro tactic would be, well, how are we going to let, put the team together? Two forwards, three backs. How are you going to lay it out? And there are a lot of little tactics you can put in place, or macro tactics, but there's still no details. A tactic are the steps you would take to get there. That's what a tactic is, there's steps. Think of it like this, who here is a chef, can cook really well? Anybody? You cook really well. So if you got instructions on cooking, would you need to have for sauteing, would someone have to write out how to saute or do you know how to saute? You know how, pretty good. Some says saute something, you say, good. Now if you guys had to saute, would you like a little bit more instructions than say, go ahead? Type a pot, temperature, how to cut, how long, right? That, those are tactics. The steps you would take to get there. That has to be passed on to execution. Execution is not the most important part about business. It's what you create here, the steps which are very cyclonic, they're thinking, thinking, thinking. When you go to the bathroom in the morning, you take a shower, you're in the, uh, in the underground, you're in the, wherever you are, you're making decisions about best ways to approach it. So if you're going on holiday, you would say, I'm going on holiday, I'm gonna go by train and by boat, um, I'm going to stay in three-star hotels. That's not a plan. A plan would be the actual itinerary when you're done, like the recipe. We never say strategy, tactics, execution, but if you noticed, people put plan up here. People will put plan down here. It's a different mindset that you have to look at the world and say, as leaders, to be more precise in a fast moving world, start off with desired outcomes, go through the strategy, figure out your macro tactics you'd like to use, figure out your tactics and create a plan that if I said, do it, it'll work. I can guarantee you most of you are saying you seldom hand somebody plans that say they could work. Now, it's 2016, I hate this about the world, especially IT, but we have agility. We need to be able to react. I don't tell how you have to stand at the, to make the food. I don't tell you the weather has to be outside. I don't micromanage the environment, but I give you enough to be able to go forward. I didn't know how to get to this place, so Julia says, why don't you meet up at 8.10 to come here? Someone comes and walks me here. Very simple plan, but it got me here. I would never have found this place. So, simple tactics. Then, so this is what it looks like, a little clearer. This is what you're paid to think about. You're paid to figure out what's the desired outcome, what's the strategy, what are the macro tactics, what are the tactics, and be able to pass it on. That's the job of a decision maker. That's it. Now, how you do that is more complicated. There, there are very few tools out there if you think about it. You have uh, SWOT analysis, you have um, data that you bring in, but those are not tools on thinking. What they are, are data gathering devices. SWOT is a data gathering device. How to make the decisions are the hard part. And following through on this, and the reason it's a cyclone, is you have inputs coming in and outputs going out. So you have financials, markets, political condition. Right now, I know one of the challenges you have is the political condition that's out there. I'm, I'm so glad I got here. I've tried to come to, uh, to Russia many times and visas didn't come through and all sorts of things have happened. I've been all over the world. I wanted to come to Russia. I went to St. Petersburg, slept 12 hours in four days. Had a blast. Got to meet people. But the rest of the world doesn't look at uh, Russia the same way. And you, many of you know that. But you have to hear what they're saying. And the difference is, I've had a few discussions, people say America versus Obama, and as compared to here, where it's uh, Putin versus the Russian people. I don't think the people know Russian people around the world. 
I don't think it's that clear what people see, but they see Putin. And people then relay it to me, say, well, you Americans always do this. Well, I'm not Obama. Beautiful? Yes. <laughs> really. So the question is, is you take the data in and you make decisions of where you go. When the financial crisis happened in the US and spread, our business went to Asia. So we, I have an office in Hong Kong, and we spend half of our, I spend half of every month in Asia. I knew the ch climate was changing, so you have to look for opportunities. This is your job. Then one of the things you should do is start to learn to use a tool called the CPM chart. The CPM chart was created by uh, General Dynamics, uh, the British uh, intelligence sector, and one other, to figure out how to handle large-scale projects and manage them in a way such as building airline, air, uh, airplanes and, uh, and ma mostly manufacturing. However, the reason I use it is because when I'm building a new company, and this is actually a company we're building, we have a, a cell phone technology we've patented, is you think through an idea in a plan that people can follow. And I'm not gonna go over how a CPM chart works. I actually have some videos that are very crude that I could share, maybe you could put online if someone would like to learn about them. It's just that you need to have some real planning tools to be able to get there. And one is called the critical path method tool. And you can find that online to see there's many examples of it. Used for manufacturing, but a way to think something forward. Here's another application to making better decisions. You have to spend time with your people and you have to grow them. Every single person I talked to were cha had challenges with people. So let me ask you, just in your own head, how often do you sit with your direct reports, the people who you're growing, to grow them? Some of you say at least once a month we sit down. Maybe an hour, maybe two. And I can guarantee you, it's not a coaching, advising, mentoring program, it's a review. Let's see how you're doing. Let's look at your numbers. Let's see what how your performance was. Let's see what's going on. When I sit down with somebody, I say, tell me what you're thinking about. Let me help you. Let me help you. One day, I, have, uh, I was with a, I, I work with a team of people. There's three executives. One of them has 600 people. One has 400. One has 200. And we meet once a month. And we do this. We sit down. And I say, what are you thinking about? And what ends up happening is each time during the discussion, they learn something, and I don't judge them, whatever questions they have. And everybody in the organization said, one guy is going to be the CEO of this company. And I, something was wrong. And one day I said to myself, I don't think he's educated or grown one person to fill his job or other jobs. That's a test. If you're growing your people, could they fill your job? If you say, I need two people to do my job, then you're not grooming people because you should have one person to do your job like you do it. Or three people, often people will say. So here's a, what I said to him, this team one day. I said, how much time do you spend? He said, I spend somewhere, David, in the range of an hour per month with each person. I said, so let's do some basic math. Nothing too complicated. I'll do it right here. We'll say you have 12 times a year and there's, 200, there's, um, there's 250 days in the year. They work 10 hours a day. That's 2,500 hours. And you spend a whopping, a big 12 hours with your management to grow them. So I said, you've known me for 18 months. When do I teach you? And I said, every time we talk, we learn something from you. Every single time you sit with us, you teach us, you grow us. No judging. So I said, let's change this. Every week, why don't you do what I do with you? Sit down and just say, hey, what are you thinking about? No judging, no criteria, no failing. So they started to, uh, then they, they said, okay. And then they decided they were also going to meet with each one of their people at least once or twice a month. I didn't follow up because that's not what they were thinking about. About six months later, one of the guys brings it up. And I said, so how's it going? And this guy who was supposed to be the leader did the 12. I said, What's going on? He says, I not only meet with my team once a week, I take out each of my five reports one time a week. I figure I'm spending 300 hours educating my management team, 300 hours. And then he turned to the other two and said, I feel like I'm doing less work. They're doing less because they're transferring skill sets. They're solving challenges together. So he's spending 300 hours versus 12. 
you do the math. How often are you sitting with your management team and teaching them something as compared to, let's see the stats, let's see the results, let's see the forms, let's see the numbers. I bet you most of you who don't spend 300 hours with your team growing them. Let me give you one last one. It's called the empowerment process. Very simply, when we empower, we empower people improperly. What we do is we say, here you go, you're empowered to go do it. A good leader understands the first thing you do to empower somebody is you create a plan on how you would empower them. The second thing that you do is you create a package of how the systems and structure will work and give them the tools, and then test it yourself. The third is then you transfer the power. Now, how would that work very simply? You sit down and you come up with a new methodology to work in the office. You try it out yourself, and then when it comes to transferring, you actually teach it to somebody. So let me give you an example, a, th a concept. You all. Some of you have children. If you have a 16-year-old child ready to drive, 17 years old, do you throw him the keys and say, well, you've seen me drive for 16 years. You're a good student, and you're very responsible. Do you do that? Why not? It's simple. You don't want them to die. But yet, we allow our employees to die all the time because we're not sitting down with them, teaching them how to work together. So let me show you the difference. Let's say the two of us, you're my child, I'm in the office. This is the way we typically work together. And hey, I'm gonna tell you this, you do this, we go back and forth. That would be option one. If you had an option of working together differently, and I said to you, look, you and I have to work on something together, and I sit right next to you and I say, here's what I've laid out as the plan. I wanna show you how I do it, and then you could tell me how you might do it, and then I'll do it with you the first two times until you're prepared. Which would you prefer? Someone who's right across the table or someone who's sitting side by side? The second one. Why? Why would you like someone sitting side by side? Feels better? Feels better. Helping, not supporting. How many of you sit side by side? You always sit across the table, and it's always a review. I've done this all over the world. It's never that side-by-side -side helping, and the way I look at it is I want my children to succeed. I even have this concept in my head, I hate 90-day programs or 90-day probation. I look at it this way. You created the job, you created the, C, the, the, um, the requirements, you put together the role, you did all the work, you looked at the applications, you spent the time reviewing them, interviewing people, you created the package and you offered it to somebody. And the person comes and they don't make it and you say, see, that person failed. You failed. You have 90 days to prove that you hired the right person. And then once that's done, and then I'll end it here, you can see the rest of it. You monitor progress and adjust. You make decisions and help them move forward. Decision makers today really have to be looking at better tools to be able to change the way they work. And these are just a few that I got from working with the people that I had on the phone. So before I end, I'd like to ask, uh, are there any questions? And you can ask anything. Are there any questions you have? What? Not at the moment. Anybody? Not quite. Not quite? What does not quite mean? So I'm still thinking about all uh, you said. I'm trying to uh, elaborate my questions right now. Okay. I will, I will talk to you uh, privately. Privately, yeah. I'll be here for the next two days. Does anybody have any questions? One question. So, we have been talking about a uh, lot of good things, right things. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, in practice, uh, we don't uh, do much often see those things we really implement. Why it's so hard to do that, to implement that? Uh, the question is, we see all of these things happening and we see that you can do this, but why is it difficult to implement these type of activities? It's very simple. It's scary how simple it is. The people who are writing the books and teaching you how to do the things that you're learning from often can't do it themselves. They also are not transferring how they think, they're transferring what they do. Watch me drive the car. Not, how am I thinking through driving the car? 
And to grow leadership in people, you have to transfer your thoughts. And we don't transfer thoughts, we transfer what we did. So you, if you're going to fire somebody, you bring your management team in and you say, let me tell you what I went through. For six months I was challenged with this. There were two of these things, three of these. I struggled because I know we need the performance. And I finally decided to do this. Instead of them seeing you, snap decision, I fired them. So getting back to the people, I know many of the authors. I wrote my book because I was tired of things not working. If Blink was so good or Tipping Point, everybody would tip, we give them a book. Good to great, seven of the 11 companies failed within five years of the book being written. Uh, Freakonomics, can't do it unless you're Steven. So I sat down and started making things for myself, and these are tools that are transferable. So this you can do. You just have to spend some time practicing it, and you'll find you'll create new opportunities as you try the new tools. Did I answer that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, anybody else? How different is this across cultures? US kind of put me the whole frame. Mm -hmm. It's really going more into the mentoring and maybe something, so I might get more. So uh -huh. if you're just guiding, like, no, you know, you can get to it other Okay. Question is how cross-culturally do you use these tools and maybe working with somebody this might get bored. Well, let me give you one concept of come back. Walk around management is not so you walk around and see, it's to talk to people and say are you doing okay. Walk around management is to see how people are performing to make new decisions. I've used this in Bangladesh, in Chittagong, in Cartagena, Colombia, in Copenhagen. I've used this with the CEOs of Maersk, Dole, Tektronics, Infosys, Wipro. I've used this all over and they all get it. So the challenge is not really as the cultural side. I'm not teaching you. You know when someone has to stand up a certain way and do. But you, you have to make a plan, right? You're going to trans new skill, new tool. Make a plan. This is what a lot of people forget. They don't build a package to give to somebody and then try it themselves. I always try things myself and I find out I'm an idiot. I made the system wrong. How often do you try? You give someone a new software program. How often do you try it? Or a new desk. Sit down at their desk. Sit by somebody using their desk. See if it works. That's not too complicated. And if your team knows, the people around you know that you're really helping them, not supporting them, it doesn't matter what culture it's in. I've used this with every culture in the world. And not that I use it in that sense. I pull out tools that are necessary in my interviews. This was necessary. A lot of letting people go. You need to slow down. And then transferring power, oh my God. We don't transfer. We um, throw people to the sharks. Have people, you've heard that? Let's throw them to the sharks. Why? You hired a person. Why do you want them around sharks? Or sink or swim. Why? It's your budget. Is, is that the way in which you let someone survive? Change the philosophy. They're, your job is to protect your people, to help them survive and thrive. And yet the books say it differently. So that's how these type of concepts came about. It works everywhere. Anybody else? Or I'll end. Okay. Very simple. Um, I met this guy, Mr. Park. He is a, a Korean who, when about 25 years ago, went to start a business manufacturing tents, T-E-N-T-S. He dominates right now about 60 to 70% of the tents manufactured in the world. And he went to Malaysia, Cambodia, Singapore, Indonesia, looking for a place to set up his plant. And as he's going around, he went to Bangladesh. And when he got there, he saw poverty beyond imagination. You don't know poverty. This is poverty. Even when you have food lines, not poverty like they have in Bangladesh. And then he looked at the people and he saw that there's no infrastructure, no electricity, no roads. And he said, this is where I'm going to put my business. People said, you're crazy. He said, I figured if I can make it there, I have uh, the arbitrage, money, I can pay a lot less, but I also felt I could make a difference. The first month after his building was built, he was the first person to build in the CEP zone. The first month he was on in these states selling tents and he watches te in television as his entire building gets washed away in a, a cyclone. Gone. He went back and rebuilt. Today, he has over a million square feet, over 15,000 employees, no bars on the windows, beautiful places. Mr. Parker is an amazing man. And at one point we're in the car driving and he looks at me and he says, 
did I make the right decision? Did you make the right decision? He has been feeding 15,000 people you know, progressively up. He's made lives better for people all over the world who've been intense. This man made a decision and was able to be forward thinking far enough to make it so that it made a difference in the lives of every one of you here who's ever been at a tent, the people who manufacture the tent, and the lives of people who are learning about what he has done. So the decisions you make today are decisions you'll live with for the next 30, 40, 50 years and the people around you. There are better tools out there in the world to be able to make better decisions. That said, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, David uh, kindly took some moderator's responsibility collecting questions uh, during the talk. So thank you very much. But probably we have some more questions. We have time for a couple of questions more if, if you have some already formulated. <laughs> Otherwise, OK. Uh, I just wanted to ask, is there any risk if you are too helpful and if you help your managers every time. Can they get used to this? And uh, maybe um, it's a bit dangerous, so they will not be able to make decisions by themselves. It's a very good question. I've never heard it asked that way. But let's first go to ha raising children. You raise children to be independent. Sometimes it's very difficult for the mother to let go. She gives too much. And I've said to my wife many times, no, no, our job is to make them to be independent. So what you do is you give them what they need to jump to the next level, to next level of expertise. And then you do the next. I don't think giving is a, is a bad way of letting somebody grow, but you need to test them with it too. Just don't let them drown. Let them uh, pull them up and say, let me help you with this. Because there, I've, with all the interviews I've done and all the work around the world that I've done and every company I've owned, I found that people come to work for a company for financial reasons is one, but the other big one is to learn from you. So if you go work for a major company, you're going to work because you want to learn from that brand. Most people leave the company saying, I never learned anything from the people around me. So if you're good at teaching them, it means you have to grow. They will in turn follow you wherever you go and you end up having an amazing team. You just don't have to give them everything. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Thank you. Sometimes uh, parents uh, do children's homework instead of them. This is not helpful, of course. <laughs> One of the techniques that I often use when people don't know this is I take my cell phone and throw it on the table during the conversation, and I record what's going on, and then I let them listen to it afterwards, and they are always shocked at how they thought they knew what they were talking about, but they weren't. So you have to ask, learn to ask questions a lot instead of telling people. How would you approach this? What are your techniques? Let me show you something that would improve that and that will change everything. But they'll see you as a support instead of the guy I fear going to because you're always gonna evaluate me. And I want my people to come to me. And I get asked all the time, how do I work with you, David? Because they wanna learn. More questions? In the back. So uh, you tend to draw the analogy between um, growing uh, your people and growing your children, but, but I tend to think that you haven't fired your children, not yet. Uh, uh, sometimes. Yeah, so, uh, and this is uh, the difference. Whatever you do, you don't fire your kid. Yeah, uh -huh. I agree with you. Uh, but it's not true that whatever your people do, you don't fire them. Correct. Uh, so when you draw this, like two parallel lines and compare every time, uh, there is a difference, but you don't point. So let me, let me share with you how to look at it a little bit differently. I use the analogy of parenting or working with people because it's an easy one. In terms of the firing side of it, whenever there's a situation, and I, I, whatever I build and everything that I write about is something I've used in the real world first. It's not pretend written in academia. I worked at NYU for 12 years, but that's not where my material came from. It came from working. What I do is say, before I say that it's that employee's challenge and they're fired, I look to myself first. And I say, did I not give the systems and structure? Did I not give them the tools? Was I not the one that onboarded them properly? How can I improve my condition? It's true, some people just don't work out. Yet if I was to start working for you tomorrow, 
How many videos do you have on how to use the basic software applications in your office? How many tools do you have to navigate the organizational chart do you have? How much time have you spent growing this person? Most people would say they're very good at getting the person in and then they're too busy to work with them. So if they fail, I always look to myself first. And so yeah, I've had to fire people. I've also had many people from CEOs to whatever fired. That said, I always look to say where did the management go wrong first, not the employee. So it's just, I, you have to use analogies that everybody can understand. But I will fire my children when I get home. <laughs> Thanks. Somebody okay. else? Somebody in the back? OK, so more questions? No. So thank you for this really engaging talk, as uh, it was promised in the conference program. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you.